my name is Wan. My surname is Wong Sun Wai, so the whole name is Wan Wong Sun Wai. It's a uh, weird sounding name because I was born in Mali Chosu. Uh, that's my hometown. It's where I was born. It's actually part of Africa. So uh, I'm now the Associate Dean of uh, CUHK Business School MBA programs. Uh, it's a pleasure to have a chance to talk to you today. This is a uh, very appropriate question, I think, because as you may know, this year is the 60th anniversary of the establishment of Chinese University of Hong Kong. And as we all know, uh, in Chinese tradition, 60 years is a very special age, right? Because you have the 12 signs of the zodiac and there are five elements. So 12 times five, that's 60, which means that we are now at the end of the first full cycle and at the start of the second cycle which is a cycle of rebirth. So it's a good question to ask, you know, in terms of uh, how we have gotten to where we are today. 60 years ago, when the university was established, the business school was also established at the same time. And uh, over the 60 years, the CUHK business school has been the pioneers for so many things. For example, the MBA program that we are offering in Hong Kong, was actually the very first one that was offered in Hong Kong and not just in Hong Kong but in this part of the world uh, in generally speaking uh, not just the MBA we were also the first to offer the EMBA program as well uh, not to mention the BBA the, the Bachelor of Business Administration so over the history of uh, the past 60 years that the university and the business school have been around uh, we have accomplished quite a bit uh, a couple of other notable things to know to to, to point out uh, the the international accreditations that are very much a, a, a way for schools and universities to, to show their quality. Uh, many of those accreditations uh, for us, we were also the first ones to uh, obtain them in Hong Kong. You're right in saying that uh, we are the oldest uh, MBA program. Now, one of the very obvious benefits or advantages will be in terms of the experience, right? The longer we have been doing something, the more we know what we are doing, right? At the same time, some people might say, if you've been around a long time and you've been doing the same thing the, you know, all this time, there's also a risk that you're old fashioned, right? But for us, that's not the case. We are quite experienced. So this knowledge that we bring is something that's very valuable for our stakeholders. But on top of that, the other side of it is the network, the big network of, of you know, former students, graduates, alumni of our programs who finished their studies with us many years ago uh, and uh, over the years have been able to contribute to the business community uh, in Hong Kong around the world and this is something that we as a program can also benefit from because our alumni you know same as many other institutions around the world alumni are very loyal alumni tend to think back you know I'm sure many of us feel the same way it's not just alumni of MB programs you know uh, my old undergraduate program I still think about it in you know very very nice ways I feel happy memories when I when I think back of uh, of my days doing my undergrad many of us feel the same way and so for us as a program in terms of the uh, the benefits and the the advantages that this uh, old network and well-established network of business professionals bring, uh, it's very hard to underestimate it. So to give you a couple of examples, when we talk about uh, in terms of curriculum or in terms of you know what we bring for our students, uh, our alumni, because they are so enthusiastic and they are very keen to contribute and give back to the school, they voluntarily, very often, spontaneously, without us even asking, they knock on our door to say, how can we help, <laughs> right? So this is something that our students, uh, you know, the students who are the current generation of students can benefit from all this accumulated knowledge, the wisdom, you know, the advice, you know, all of these good things that come with experience. We can provide it not just ourselves as a program, but also the alumni of our program can provide this kind of, uh, you know, wisdom passed down from older, more experienced uh, people who have been in the same situation. In 
Indeed. So, so far we have been talking about the program as a collection of uh, professionals who are administering the, you know, the way to deliver the education and also the alumni and the students. But, you, you know, the faculty, the people who are there to deliver the teaching are also a very, very important part of the entire ecosystem. So for us, the way I see it, you know, in order to be able to deliver what we did over the last 60 years, it is critical to have faculty members who are not just good teachers, right? But they also need to have this innate curiosity to, to be curious about the world and to be passing this kind of curiosity to their students. And when we talk about people who are curious and want to understand the world, basically we are talking about researchers, right? People who want to understand by conducting research, whether it's academic or more practitioner oriented. But uh, in my mind, you know, for a strong faculty body to accompany uh, MBA programs like the ones that we offer, we need a good mix of people from different backgrounds. It's the same as with the students. You know, we, in an MBA program especially, it's very rare to encounter a homogeneous group of students. Everyone will come from different backgrounds. And on the faculty side, I think it's the same thing. We see many faculty members with many diverse interests from different backgrounds, different countries in terms of nationality, having trained in different countries, different regimes. Everyone brings together or gets put together in one place and that can create a lot of synergies and a lot of benefits coming out of this kind of mingling. When we are thinking about talent development, you know, of course, as an MBA program, we are focused on delivering rigorous academic content, right? So when students sign up with us and we have the faculty members assigned to teach them certain courses, the courses are quite rigorous in terms of the academics. But to develop talent in this sense of having future global business leaders who are able to tackle, you know, unseen new challenges, they need more than just academic knowledge. And this goes back to the discussion we were having just now about the network, being part of a network. So a large part of the MBA experience with us is not necessarily about gaining the academic knowledge. It's important, yes, but equally important, but some people might say it's even more important in terms of developing this talent, this idea of talent development, is the sense of belonging to a network and not just asking the network to help us, but also asking ourselves how we can help the network. Because once we become part of a network, we are there forever, right? It's like one of those kinds of clubs where once you're a member of the club, you're there. And um, uh, so talent development is a combination of strengths in both the academic area and also uh, a lot of the non-academic, this accompanying, we can call it co-curricular or extracurricular uh, set of activities. We actually have a whole range of uh, activities that are designed to, to help students achieve this leap into leadership, right? So it, it's all part of this talent development, right? So in the end, an MBA program like ours, we are, you know, the ambition we have is to help develop our students into global business leaders. Now, business leaders do not get developed overnight. It requires a lot of work, a lot of effort. So we actually have set up a series of different situations that our students find themselves in, which allow them to practice, develop, learn about these kinds of leadership skills and qualities. And these happen at many different levels. So I'll give you a few very simple examples. In a class setting, for example, so I teach a course, one of the required courses, and uh, for my course, um, I have uh, you know, several cohorts of students. For each group of students, we will ask them to select two class representatives. Now, when students get nominated or get voted to become the class representatives, they now find themselves in a position of responsibility because they have to now you know, be the representatives of the class, which means they have to take the initiative to, you know, to preempt some potential classroom issues, inform the teacher, inform the teaching assistant. So that requires a little bit of leadership development already. 
But this is at a very sort of local level within one classroom. You can then start thinking there are other situations, for example, with student clubs. We encourage our students to form clubs which are then going to uh, tackle non-academic activities. So, for example, uh, industry interests, right? So if some of our students are very interested in, let's say, the finance industry, as an example, we ask students, you know, to form a club if they have that kind of interest. And the club will then be run by the students themselves, which means that some of the students who are interested in, let's say, the finance industry, will have to step up and become the leaders of the finance club, right? And that kind of leadership role is quite different from the class representative because it's not about the class material anymore. It's about beyond the class material. How do you, you know, find counterparts in industry, guest speakers for certain events? How do you even think of what types of events to organize? There are a whole host of other uh, types of leadership uh, activities to think about and to get practice in and to become more proficient in. So these are just two examples I can think of, but there are so many others, uh, many other roles where uh, students take on these kinds of leadership responsibilities. And by doing, that's the best way for them to learn how to become a leader themselves. So thinking about entrepreneurship and uh, how to develop an entrepreneurial mindset among students, um, I don't know if you remember the statistics. The statistics say that 95% uh, at least of all startups will fail. It's a known fact right, around the world. So there's a very high chance of failure. 19 out of 20 uh, startups are going to fail. Now, how do we teach something like this to students? Because your question is about you know, how to develop this entrepreneurial mindset. So one of the first things I would say is uh, it's not enough to just learn about these things in an academic setting in a classroom. If you sit in a classroom and we tell you 95% of startups will fail, I can guarantee you more than 5% of the students in the class will think I'm not going to be that 95%, right? Because we are confident. We want to be optimistic. So one way that we try to develop this mentality, this appreciation, this realization is through experience. Just get your hands dirty. Do not just, you know, think about the theory and then you know, imagine that you're the lucky one, right? So one of the things we've done in uh, CUHK MBA program uh, in past years, and we are continuing, is uh, to give students a chance to see deep inside failed ventures, right? So very often when we look at uh, the way that uh, material is taught, we tend to focus on the success stories. We tend to highlight things that work. Right? So what we want to do is also give students an idea, a sense of what it's like when things don't work. So one of the uh, experiences we've been doing for many years is to identify ventures that did not work out. And then we use this word retooling. We ask students to work with the founders of those ventures, discuss what went wrong, find out what could have been done differently and have a chance to retool the, the venture, right? Change something in it to make it more attractive, for example, or improve the chance of succeeding in a market where previously it did not succeed. So I think for these experiences, that's kind of the best way to make, you know, to, to teach students about these notions of entrepreneurship. If you ask uh, traditionally over the last many decades, what are the reasons for uh, applicants wanting to do an MBA? I think uh, you know, very often in the, in the past few years, you would have heard you know, one of three main reasons. One is uh, you want to get a promotion at work and an MBA might be a way to demonstrate your suitability and your ability to handle you know, leadership type tasks. So, Getting a promotion in your job where you're feeling quite happy, but you want to look at this next step. The second common one is, you know, you're not very happy with your current job. You want to change your line of work. You want to go and do something different. And M MBA, again, is you know, one of those, you know, it's a very big decision for someone to want to do an MBA. 
and it often provides this chance to recalibrate your own thoughts about what you want to do in the future. Right? So this is a second very important reason, which is that people want to uh, you know, change direction in their career. The third biggest reason in the past, historically, traditionally, has been entrepreneurs, right? the subject we were talking about just now. Often people feel that you know, they have this ambition of uh, starting a, their own business one day, but they are a bit unsure how to do it. And uh, an MBA is a very structured way of gaining this kind of knowledge. Now, I say these are the three sort of traditional reasons because more and more, increasingly, um, I think I'm feeling it more that there seems to be more of a trend nowadays of people who are thinking of doing an MBA, not for one of those three reasons, but uh, essentially because they are looking for personal and uh, uh, perhaps professional growth without one of these three specific factors in mind, right? Yes, it's not as if they are looking for a promotion or trying to change career direction or thinking of creating their own business, but rather they just feel that there's something missing in their knowledge base. And an MBA is a way to acquire it while at the same time becoming part of this big network of successful business professionals. So I would say nowadays, if you ask me the question, I would say there are you know, potentially four main reasons that, uh, that students are thinking of doing an MBA. I have uh, you know, some advice and some tips. Uh, the first thing is do your research properly. So know what you're getting into. All MBA programs are different. Every single one of them has something different to offer. So if you find something interesting about CUHK's MBA program and you want to have a chance of joining this, uh, the, you know, our program, I would say do your research properly because if you get to the stage of receiving an interview invitation, you need to be able to express yourself so that the person interviewing you knows that you have done your research, that you understand what it is that you're getting into. It is not helpful for either a prospective student or a new student to join an MBA program and then realize it's not the right thing for them. It's too late, right? It's kind of you've already done a lot of sacrifices by the time you get to that stage. So my advice is, first of all, do your research. Know what you are getting into and what each program is able to offer. The second thing is also, it's, it's a little bit harder, but I, I would say it's also you know, something I encourage applicants to think about. Think about why you want the MBA. I say it's harder because sometimes we don't really know why we want something. We just feel that we want it, but we don't really know why, right? So it's also part of our job as a program to help you discover these reasons. You may not know, you cannot articulate it, but you need to have a little bit of a feeling of why you want to do this particular MBA with CUHK. Because uh, one of the tips uh, is that during interview process, the interview panel will be looking for what we refer to as the degree of fit. Whether a prospective student is going to be able to benefit from our program the way they are thinking, and whether we as a program also feel that we can help that person progress towards their objectives. If that is not um, clear to the interview panel, then it's not a good sign, right? Because then the panel might have some doubt about whether or not the program can actually help you achieve your goals. If we feel we cannot, you know, we probably should not make you take that big step of, uh, you know, changing your life around and then finding out this is not what you're looking for. So I would say, you know, th these are the two main things. One is know what the program is about. So do your research about the programs properly. And the second one is link it to what you want for yourself. If you can make that story clear and you can explain it during an interview, there's a much higher chance the panel will agree that there's a good fit and uh, then you will receive the offer. <laughs>